Hello dear tea friends from around the world and welcome to a new tea class with me, Stéphane Erler, the founder of the Tea Masters blog and the tea-masters.com boutique. Today we are going to examine our last part of The White Road, a Journey into an Obsession, a book by Edmund de Val, an English ceramist. And um, uh, in this part, uh, we will talk about um, really the obsession part. Huh? Uh, when he talks, when he says it's a journey into an obsession, uh, we will see more the, the dark side of uh, this obsession. And uh, if you are watching me on YouTube, I recommend that you first watch this uh, video, uh, the first uh, three parts uh, of uh, this uh, class. Uh, part one was on Jing De Zen, part two was on Meissen, German porcelain, and uh, part three was on English porcelain. Now, uh, also, what is my habit? I will uh, drink, make some tea while I'm um, going to talk about uh, uh, this book. And uh, you can see I'm. this is all red. It's going to be a very uh, oxidized tea. Let me see if I can see your comments. Can you hear me well? Uh, okay. Please let me know if there is any uh, problem with the sound. And uh, oh, I hope that uh, there won't be another interruption. So uh, we are going to touch on a very uh, sensitive issue today. We are going to speak about uh, a little bit more political aspect uh, and uh, some uh, the dark side of porcelain. For Edmund de Val, this uh, play between um, porcelain and um, dictatorships uh, started in 1919 in Russia when the Imperial Porcelain Factory in St. Petersburg transformed into the State Porcelain Factory. So the communists uh, who took over uh, Russia two years ago, uh, they were thinking, okay, we are not going to uh, uh, throw away uh, porcelain making, we are going to use it for our own purposes. And um, so they transformed this um, imperial porcelain factory into a state uh, porcelain factory. And um, they found quickly that uh, they can use it a little bit for, um, for several purposes. One purpose is that these large white uh, items that were created out of porcelain were a nice um, support uh, were a, a nice background to write uh, phrases, to write slogans uh, about the communist ideas, um, to encourage uh, the workers, uh, workers unite, something like, like this, or to have badges, uh, plates, with, um, also with a uh, uh, flag of the communist party. And another thing, they thought, okay, we, are, we can revolutionize uh, porcelain uh, and the design. And here we have, for instance, uh, Malevich, uh, a Russian who created half cup, half cups, uh, for in, so a very revolutionary design. Uh, so instead of, of having a round cup, he cut the round in two, and uh, it it made a. Uh, a really a very new revolutionary design. At uh, the same time in um, 1919 in uh, China the uh, imperial system had also come to an end uh, since uh, 1911 actually and uh, because the, the court, the emperor was the main uh, purchaser of uh, porcelain uh, of the best wares. The Jing De Zen was really in a very bad state. It was um, impoverished. Uh, the apprentices uh, were very well, very badly 
uh, employed, they had uh, very little money to sustain themselves, and uh, there was really room for improvement, room for, for change, and uh, this change would come very soon with uh, also the Communist Party, who would give uh, the poor workers more, more rights over there. Um, then we we'll move now uh, to um, to Germany. Over there, there was a Bauhaus movement, which was not so much concerned about uh, porcelain, and it really preferred to use steel and concrete and glass. Um, uh, so, and it also liked to have these uh, very hard uh, angles. Um, so porcelain was a bit neglected for a while in in Germany. But uh, when the uh, NSDAP, the National Socialist Party of Adolf Hitler took power, uh, they found some interest in porcelain. And actually, it is uh, Himmler, a really a high figure in the government of Hitler, who uh, invested um, 45,000 Reichsmarks uh, of his money into a company called Allach, based in uh, Munich, actually very close to Munich, uh, in a, a small town called Dachau. And um, over there, uh, they started to make uh, then German porcelain. Uh, and uh, this uh, Allach porcelain factory. Uh, it started to make lots of um, figurines that were uh, used as presents uh, for the Nazi party. So uh, they created uh, figurines of, of um, animals, but also lots of soldiers and even Frederick the Great on a horse. And uh, this, uh, it, there was a lot of uh, technical uh, skill that was going into making uh, these uh, figurines, especially the horse, because it's, um, all the weight is uh, concentrated on just on a, a few feet. And especially if, uh, if you want to, sh to portray the, uh, the horse uh, walking, then a couple of feet are maybe in the air, then all the weight really is, is just on two feet. So this was really a, a very uh, technical feast to be able to achieve um, this kind of figurine. This was one of the uh, of their uh, best um, pieces. And uh, imagine whom? Uh, Adolf Hitler had uh, this horse with um, Frederick the Great in his office. Uh, I don't like to speak about this. So maybe, uh, uh, so uh, make, let's make some tea to, to cool down. Uh, just the bare mention of this name, Iki. Um, the other figurines that they were making were soldiers, of course. I'm preparing um, uh, also the, the folk, the, the population for more uh, war-like um, uh, imagination and uh, to get the, the population into this mood. Uh, one of the um, favorite uh, top seller um, figurine was uh, Der Fechter, so uh, a swordsman uh, who was uh, uh, naked on top, uh, very handsome, of course, uh, muscular, and uh, with his sword, really also looking very elegant. And uh, it was uh, so prized that only the, it was reserved really for the, for the Nazi. Uh, party members uh, only they could uh, could get it. So this really reminds us of um, how porcelain had been used also in uh, China for uh, for centuries. That um, this guanyao, this uh, uh, imperial ware, were first produced for the emperor, and then he would give them to his loyal generals, maybe to ambassadors, as uh, as gifts to um, to neighbors, so that they would uh, have a uh, good um, friendship with China or to his uh, ministers so that they would work hard and uh, to his uh, family members so that they would not kill him etc etc so we here we see again the same kind of use 
for this uh, Alar porcelain in Germany by the Nazi party uh, to curry favor uh, from the party members and from the public. And they were really uh, very successful uh, with it. Uh, the uh, factory produced a lot. They uh, kind of uh, copied a little bit on uh, Meissen. You remember Meissen, the trademark are two swords. Now, guess what they would use for Alar porcelain? They would use two S, so SS. It looks very much like SS, just it's a little bit closer together. Uh, it also creates a, a mirror kind of effect, like uh, with the two swords of, um, of Meissen. Uh, so, a very, uh, a very stylish uh, trademark. Now, I don't have any memorabilia to, to sh show you. I'm, uh, I'm not a collector of uh, this kind of uh, porcelain from uh, dictators, uh, uh, not from Allah and also not later from, um, from, um, from Mao Zedong. So uh, uh, I don't apologize for not showing you any because I really don't have any. <laughs> now, let's make some tea. Cool down from this very grave and uh, ugly subject. But the, uh, the idea, I think, of uh, Edmond Deval is he did not want to make a, he wanted to make an honest book. He wanted to, to show really porcelain uh, in, through all its excesses, the, the beautiful excesses, the excesses of um, skills, the excess of how innovative the Chinese were long before the Europeans, the excesses it took to create porcelain in, uh, in Europe, uh, it was almost like an alchemy, or in England when they would go to, uh, the, uh, to the US, to the Cherokee nation to, to look for uh, this white clay, uh, really, it's a, it's a story of excess, and um, he wanted, to, I think, uh, to, to be completely fair and honest that uh, these excesses also translated in the realms of politics. And uh, porcelain uh, had, uh, has some wonderful uses now, especially to, to make tea, but it also has a dark side, is that, um, like money, uh, you can use money to make good things, uh, do, do good deeds, but you can also use money to buy weapons or drugs. So it's a, very much the same with, um, with porcelain. Porcelain itself is beautiful, but it can also be used by the bad people. Oh, by the way, the tea I'm making is um, Imperial Oriental Beauty from summer 2020. Uh, actually, I keep it in this uh, double happiness jar for better aging, natural aging in uh, porcelain. And uh, it's, uh, yes, Imperial, that's why I wanted to, to use it really. We are uh, using a very exceptional tea. It can be, it has a, a really a, a red uh, style, high oxidation, so my red chabu, this red ambiance uh, that I wanted to create for, because we are going to, we are speaking about the Nazi party and the Communist party, both parties were using red a lot. Uh, as for my clothes, it's a, a Mao style uh, shirt, and that's why I'm wearing it today. And for the music, uh, I don't have uh, lots of. Uh, uh, I, I could not find any Wagner actually. Uh, of course, I have even less uh, 
German marches from the Second World War. But I, uh, in, on this uh, CD I'm listening to, at the end, this Chinese is singing a song composed by Mao Zedong, actually. It's a poem by Mao Zedong that uh, he has turned into a song. So that's uh, my musical connection to this to today's subject. Cheers. Mm. But I always say it's this kind of uh, imperial oriental beauty is uh, really much more like um, uh, perfumes and the tea. It's uh, a different. Um, on a di we are on a different level. Mm. Let me see if I can. Get your messages here. Mm. No, still not streaming. Mm. Well, we'll see. Um. Let's continue about um, uh, Alar. So, one of the key details about uh, Alar is that uh, it was um, in uh, Dachau, and uh, this proved to be um, a good location during the war uh, because once uh, the lots of workers were taken to go to the front to, to become soldiers for the, for the Reich. And uh, so they were lacking um, uh, workers at the time when uh, they were still going to, where they were still producing a lot of figurines. There was still a high demand by um, the Nazi party during the Second World War. They even opened uh, shops in Poland so in occupied eastern uh, uh, countries to sell their wares. And uh, uh, then in um, 1940, Allah moved its uh, factory to the concentration camp. And uh, there, uh, the uh, prisoners from the concentration camp could little by little replace the Germans who went to the front. It's, um, uh, it was really part of a, of a whole system for the Germans, for, the, for Hitler, uh, the Nazi party. Deutsch sein heißt klar sein. Uh, to be German means to be clear. So they, uh, there was this idea of, uh, also of purity, of clarity, of skill, of force. And all these characteristics, they could be shown in the porcelain. Of course, we have the purity, the whiteness. Uh, lots of figurines were painted, but actually the majority remained white. That's uh, how uh, Himmler preferred them. When some, he looked at uh, some uh, figurines that were painted and uh, he complained he would write, even while uh, at the, still at the front, he would still continue to manage the artistic side of uh, the porcelain produced in Allah and say, no, no, this uh, does not go. You uh, just keep them white. Uh, they look uh, even better, more perfect, more pure like this. And uh, so the ideology of um, the Nazi regime really was very well reflected for him in the porcelain produced by the Allah factory. Uh, also, they wanted to um, uh, embody the, a new uh, civilization based on very old uh, European roots and for them the uh, first model for this, gen for this civilization was the Greek civilization and these white figurines were really reminiscent of uh, marble, white marble statues from the Greek era and uh, that was another reason why uh, this white was so important for, um, for the Allah uh, factory. Um, there's another quote, Kein Volk lebt länger als die Dokumente seiner Kultur. Uh, there is no people that lives longer than the 
uh, production of its own culture. So uh, to be able to produce uh, something that would last a long, long time, like porcelain, this would really help to um, make the German uh, Reich last longer. Well, did not work. But this was also another reason why um, porcelain was uh, so much appreciated and that um, uh, lots of uh, uh, all the top brass from the Nazi party went to Allah and uh, have a look at um, the figurines produced there. The irony is that in during the war, uh, starting 1940, all of these uh, figurines were not produced by Germans anymore, but they were produced mostly by uh, the Jewish prisoners. <laughs> One of them is uh, Hans Landauer, uh, a socialist uh, who went to um, Dachau on uh, June uh, 1941. And um, for him, actually, uh, it was a luck. Uh, also, ironically, um, the porcelain did help save uh, prisoners because when they were skilled, enough and like uh, he was for um, for for drawing uh, they could be taken and work in this uh, factory and it was much uh, better work to work in Allah porcelain factory than to work in the other jobs at the concentration camps you did not have to uh, uh, to go so often uh, to uh, for the count uh, for the counting of uh, the, the prisoners and uh, you had better meals so uh, working for this porcelain factory actually uh, also was uh, uh, a, st uh, a luck uh, if you can say so of course they were unlucky to to be in the concentration camp but they were lucky uh, to be working in the porcelain factory and uh, what is uh, interesting is that of course when the russians uh, and the, or the Americans, uh, I think the Americans who came and liberated Dachau, uh, they quickly destroyed all the the, the molds to to produce the uh, the soldiers, the figurines. Only some animal figurines were uh, uh, were saved, and uh, these animal figurines continued to be used um, after the. Second World War by um, a porcelain factory called uh, Oscar Schaller and Company. Now, uh, this is already uh, a lot to, to take in, but what is interesting is that um, uh, Edmund de Waal continues just after the Second World War in uh, the eastern part of uh, Germany, now the communist part. Um, they, one of the very first film that uh, was produced and uh, subsidized by, this, uh, by the Communist Party in uh, the eastern part of Germany was about Meissen. So even there, the communists in Germany, they saw also porcelain uh, as uh, important for the revival of, uh, the, uh, of the eastern part of Germany after the Second World War. They even uh, started to col collaborate with uh, uh, China in uh, 1955. Uh, the um, Eastern Germans sent some workers from Meissen to Jingdezhen to help the Chinese start production again. Unfortunately, uh, the relationship between uh, East Germany and um, China they soured, and uh, by 1959, this uh, cooperation was stopped, uh, and the Germans who were there either fled or, um, or had to return to, uh, to Germany. We also have, um, you remember the Russian state uh, porcelain factory, and uh, this time when um, Stalin was uh, having his 70th birthday, he was together on the Red Square, uh, look, uh, seeing the army in front of him, and he was together with Mao Zedong. And um, on this occasion, for Stalin's 70th birthday, uh, the Russian state porcelain factory, they produced a porcelain statue 
of Mao Zedong and Stalin together uh, also as a, a work of propaganda to, to show the good relationships between uh, China and uh, communist uh, China and communist Russia. Um, then, uh, so we see the, that uh, using porcelain as uh, propaganda was not uh, left just to the um, uh, Russians or to the Nazis. It was also quickly done uh, on, in the Russian part of Germany and in, uh, uh, under the Stalin uh, regime. And then the book finishes also with the part where Mao Zedong uses uh, porcelain. Uh, in the first part, I think I've already said that a um, um, tea set had been created for, uh, for Mao Zedong. He received it and, uh, just before he died. Uh, the last uh, imperial tea set, uh, as it can be called. Um, but um, um, before that, in um, uh, summer of uh, 1966, the, in Jingde Zen, they created the first Mao Zedong badges. Um, so, uh, out of porcelain and uh, a painting of Mao Zedong. They were, it was really a very risky undertaking for them because uh, imagine you drew Mao Zedong in a way that uh, he did not like. Uh, this could mean the end of your life. So, uh, they were very uh, apprehensive of taking up uh, this kind of, uh, of work, but um, uh, the pressure was too high and uh, at the end they, uh, they managed to, to do so and uh, to, to make a portrait of Mao Zedong that Mao Zedong liked. That's why it was, it's always the same, uh, they, because they think, okay, if he likes this one, I'm going to, to stick to this one. I don't want to, to try a different one. This is too much of a risk for me. And uh, so in uh, 1966, they started to have these uh, little badges that you could click on your, on your clothes uh, to show that you uh, approve of Mao Zedong, that you love him. And uh, these were, uh, they were in production until now, actually. Uh, the, uh, one of the ceremonies remembers that uh, the best year for for this, for sales of these badges was uh, 1993 actually so uh, with all this um, what Edmund de Val also wants to show is that um, porcelain white porcelain is beautiful but it also has a cost right? uh, it costs in terms of um, wood of fire, of pollution, uh, of earth that is used up, of uh, shipping, right? it takes, uh, it's very heavy, so it costs a lot of uh, shipping expenses, and it will produce a lot of uh, air pollution, uh, dust in the workshop, but also with the firing um, uh, CO2 and dust. So uh, you always have to uh, compare the benefits and, and the cost to, to make it worthwhile. And, and therefore, uh, porcelain really should be made uh, with skill, with uh, an aim for perfection, so that uh, the beauty it creates can um, uh, be greater than the costs that uh, it uh, also uh, incurs. Uh, for Edmund de Waal, porcelain is an obsession that uh, he has uh, continued um, to pursue for, for all his life. And uh, uh, following last week's uh, um, uh, course about uh, England, I contacted uh, Michel Francois, who told me that uh, actually he's, uh, uh, he knows uh, Edmond de Waal uh, privately and uh, personally, so it was. Uh, I'm, I'm glad I have uh, almost a uh, direct connection with uh, with this author, author. And uh, the reason that um, Edmond de Waal so much likes uh, porcelain is for him, porcelain, white porcelain, is a way of a uh, new start. Uh, it's the idea. It's like the um, white uh, page. It's. Uh, 
some, something where you can start a new to write a new chapter of your life that you can start a new story you can go in a new direction so um, yes this is something I had not uh, thought of before when you empty a cup and now you see all this whiteness uh, it gives you a fresh start in uh, in the day and with this I wish you also a fresh new start in your weekend and uh, in your spring don't forget to uh, like this video uh, and uh, if you need some tea come to my website thank you very much for watching bye bye